Good afternoon. This is nuclear plant components. This is lecture two. So we left off in our first lecture um, talking about check valves. And we covered swing checks. In which flow from inlet to outlet pushes the disc open. And then flow from outlet to inlet pushes the disc closed. We talked about lift check valves. Where we said the bodies resemble globe valves. And we talked about the torturous path globe, the um, flow the globe valves make and the um, which gives you a relatively um, large pressure drop or pressure loss. We said flow to lift check valves must always enter below the seat. So we're going to start today talking about stop check valves. These valves closely resemble globe valves Once again, we're talking about the path the fluid makes through the body. What makes these valves special is that the disc can be forcibly closed by an actuator. Now the key to these check valves we've noticed so far, flow in one direction helps open the valves, flow in the other direction closes the valves. But this in these valves, we can prevent flow in either direction. So for stop check valves, you can stop flow in both directions. The stem is not connected to the disc, but it functions to close the valve tightly or to limit the travel of the valve disc 
in the open. Direction. So for stop check valves, they are, they are used when the combined functions of check and globe valves are desired. So if the flow is <coughs> is from beneath the seat or beneath the disc then the flow will lift the disc allowing flow through the valve. If flow is from above the disc then the flow will seat the disc preventing flow through the valve Next, we'll talk about pressure reducing valves.
these valves are designed to automatically reduce downstream pressure to a set desired pressure This requires that the supply pressure be at least as high as the desired pressure. So there are five major components that make up the internals of a pressure reducing valve. And we'll describe them and how they work. You have the main valve, the auxiliary valve, you have the controlling diaphragm you have the adjusting screw and you have the adjusting spring So in this valve, the positioning screw sets the desired output pressure of the reducing valve. So in this valve, this is the flow here. You have your main piston here. This is your main valve spring. This is your main valve. You have a high pressure port and a low pressure port. This is your auxiliary valve spring. This is your adjusting spring right here. And the adjusting screw. And this is the controlling diaphragm right here. So like we said, the positioning screw, I mean, sorry, the adjusting screw position sets the desired output pressure of the reducing valve. So, 
Under normal operation, the high pressure on the upstream side of the pressure reducing valve is ported to two locations. So this is the upstream side right here. So the high pressure um, fluid goes this way or it goes up this way right here, this port right here. So it serves two functions. Number one, it assists the main valve spring, which is right here, and holding the main valve closed. So it keeps this valve here pushed up. Secondly, the high pressure fluid is also applied to the auxiliary valve. As we said, it comes up here, this port. Auxiliary valve is right here. So the position of the auxiliary valve determines what happens next. If the downstream pressure drops below the desired level, the force of the adjusting spring right here will overcome the pressure exerted under the diaphragm by the low pressure port. So low pressure port here is under the diaphragm. If that pressure then, so right now the pressure you can say is in equilibrium or greater than equal to the force of the adjusting spring. But if it decreases, then the adjusting spring will cause this diaphragm to open. Or I should say come down, open the auxiliary valve, to be more accurately. Then this allows some pressure from the high pressure port to enter and pressurize the area above the main piston. Then this main piston, you can see this diameter or this width is wider than that of the main valve. So like we said, the high pressure force holds the main valve open and it also enters up above here once the auxiliary valve is open. Now, pressure is force over area. You would agree that the main valve's area or surface area is less than the surface area of the main piston. So if the pressures are equal, right? High pressure port, these pressure is the same here and there. Then rearranging this equation, force is pressure times area. So if the pressure is equal between at these two locations, but the area is greater at the main valve, then that's a higher force that is being applied down by the same pressure due to the larger surface area. So that forces this main piston down, which then for push, which is connected to the main valve. The main valve goes down and then high pressure fluid can now proceed through the valve. So when the downstream pressure rises to the set point, which means the downstream pressure increases, then it, it overcomes the force of the spring, then closing the auxiliary valve, which means then the main piston no longer has that high pressure fluid pushing down upon it. So the main piston goes back up to a starting spot and the main valve closes. Therefore, once it closed, nothing will happen. So that's pretty much how it works. Next, we'll cover relief valves. 
primary purpose of relief valves is to provide over pressure protection to a component or system. We all know the common saying, pressure bust pipes. Um, so what we're saying is we don't want the pressure in the system to exceed too high because that could lead to damage to different components. So the pressure exceeds a certain set point. We want some kind of relief or release so that the pressure can go back into safe limits. So let's pull it up. So the relief valve is held closed by a spring. So this spring here keeps the disc closed. This is the inlet. The disc is closed. This is outlet. So currently, the fluid cannot escape the valve. However, if the pressure below the disc, overcomes the spring pressure that is holding the disc down the valve begins to open So this over pressure condition overcomes the spring force applied and lifts the disc. which allows the system pressure to be relieved. So once this inlet pressure exceeds the spring pressure here, it pushes the disc up and allows fluid to escape out the outlet. As the pressure begins to decrease, which means the system pressure decreases, the spring pressure then begins to push the disc down close until the valve closes. So the relief valve begins to open at the pressure set point, but is not fully open until some higher pressure. So let's define a new term relief valve accumulation and to find is that pressure above the preset pressure
at which the valve is fully open. So accumulation is normally expressed in percent of the preset pressure. So P fully open, pressure where it's fully open, minus the pressure set point, where, which is the pressure where it starts to open, over the pressure set point times 100%. So if I said, if I gave you, hey, for a relief valve, you have the following specifications. Set point, pressure, which is the pressure where the valve will start to open, is 1,200 PSI absolute. We said, hey, maximum pressure You say valve will be fully open. So I said 1242 PSI absolute. Did I say calculate the percent accumulation for this um, relief valve? So then setting up the equation, we says pressure, the fully open pressure, which in this case we said is 1,242 PSI absolute minus the set point pressure where it starts to open, 1,200 over the set point pressure. Times a hundred percent you get three point five percent Safety valves. These are similar to in function to relief valves in that the primary function is to provide over pressure protection for a system or component. The difference is safety valves are designed To fully open instantly at the preset pressure set point. 
as we said before, with a relief valve is a is a gradual opening of the disc. Here we want instant fully open at the set uh, pressure set point. This allows safety valves. to provide a large volume release path at low overpressure conditions. There is no accumulation with safety valves. Because, because as we said, is once you hit that pressure set point, they open instantly. They open, I mean, sorry, they open fully instantly. And they stay fully open until the pressure falls below the preset pressure. Then they close. So this is the so this this is the system this is where the system pressure enters or uh, touches the disc right here. So as you can see, this is an area where we describe as A one. So initially, this valve disc is exposed. Um, to the system pressure, but it's only a small function. The green is the valve disc. And between these barriers here, or these borders, only a small area of the valve, the green valve disc is exposed to the system pressure. And once again, the spring pressure here holds the disc closed. So once the system pressure increases, Above that of the spring pressure, the valve, the green valve disc begins to open. So once it opens, or begins to open, I should say, now you have a larger surface area that is exposed to the same system pressure. So once again, we said pressure is force over area. So if the system, so re, if we rearrange the equation, we have force is pressure times area. Well, the system pressure is the same. This is a constant. But once that this begins to rise a little bit, now more surface area is exposed to the same system pressure. Basically described as A2. So the force then is greater because if P is constant, you now have A2 times P versus A1. And if A2 is greater, greater surface area, the force will be larger. And this causes the valve to open very rapidly. So as long as the system pressure remains high, the safety valve will remain open. Once the system pressure begins to decrease, at some point the force exerted by the spring pressure and the weight of the disc will exceed the force generated by the system pressure. 
And when this happens, the valve will close. We will define another term, percent blowdown. Which is P set point, the, pre the set point pressure minus the reset pressure where the valve closes again over the P set point pressure. Or, I'm sorry, set point pressure. So blow down the difference between the preset. Pressure set point and the actual pressure at which the safety valve receives. And this is times 100%. So if I gave you some safety valve specifications, I say the set point pressure Twelve hundred psi absolute and I say the reset or receipt pressure where the valve be fully closed is eleven fifty two. What is the percent blow down associated with this valve? Reset pressure So, when comparing steam over pressure protection valves, with water over pressure protection valves two thumb rules apply or two two um, rules of rule thumbs rules of thumb apply thumb rules First, the mass flow rate or mass lost by the system is lower for a valve that relieves steam. Secondly, 
the pressure drop is faster when a valve lifts to relieve a vessel filled solid with water than when the valve passes steam. This is why Relief valves typically used for incompressible fluids such as oil or water. And safety valves typically used for compressible fluids. to steam or other gases. Valve operation. So manual hand wheel valve operation is usually such that counterclockwise direction opens the valve and clockwise direction closes the valve. Due to the design of some valve types, the valve body cools faster than the disc. This causes the valve seat to bind against.
against the valve disc. This is called thermal binding. Binding can also occur when liquid becomes trapped in the valve bonnet. Valve position verification is essential for safe operation in the plant or facility. Valve position can be determined by a number of met methods. Valve positions can be checked physically, visually, or by using remote indications. When locally determining valve position, check the valve position by turning the hand wheel a short distance and we'll say one quarter turn in the closed direction. If the valve is initially open, then then the valve stem 
will move in the closed direction. Always return the valve to its original position. Checking a manual valve in the closed direction is used due to the negligible, negligible effects on the system. For example, if the valve is currently isolating a portion of the system that portion continues to be isolated if the valve is open Closing a quarter turn would have minimal effect on the system parameters. Using system indications to check valve position should be used as a backup verification. Examples of system indications are uh, listening for flow noise, filling pipes for flow by vibration. Post-maintenance testing, valve repair and maintenance in plants occur very often and after, after it is completed, you have to test to make sure the valves are operating as they should.
So the post maintenance test can include leakage tests to verify leakage past the valve seat or packing is within the specifications for that valve and application. You have verification of valve response. to automatic position signals hydrostatic testing to ensure the valve and connections are capable of withstanding the normal operating conditions to which the valve will be exposed. And there are others. Valve failure modes. The failure mode of a valve or valve and actuator is a design de decision which depends on the application of the valve in the system. Failure mode is the position a valve takes on loss of the motor force to operate its actuator. For example, loss of pneumatics or loss of power. A valve has one of the following failure modes. You have fail open. Fail closed, fail as is. Okay, this concludes our covering of valves. The homework will be posted soon on Blackboard. Please complete the homework. If there are any questions, feel free to email me and we can discuss. So next, we'll begin our discussion on pumps. This next chapter. So we'll begin pumps today.
So first let's define what a pump is. A pump is a device that uses an external source of energy to move fluid from one place to another. This is accomplished by imposing differential pressure on the fluid. The differential pressure forces the fluid to flow through a piping system to an area of lower pressure. All pumps have two ends. You have the power end that connects to the prime mover. This is electrical motor or diesel engine. The other end is the fluid end that performs the actual work on the fluid to raise its pressure. Different pumps are designed to fulfill different functions. Some are designed to move large volumes of fluid. At relatively low pressures. Others pump small volumes of fluid at very high pressures.
Some are designed to move thick, heavy fluids. Others move clear, light fluids. But the key function is all pumps move fluids. There are two main classifications of pumps. You have kinetic pumps, also the term dynamic, versus positive displacement. Both categories have several different designs, um, several different applications. And there are some pumps that don't fit into either category. So let's define some terms that are, we use, we're gonna use in our discussion of pumps. Capacity. This is the rated volumetric flow rate for a specific set of parameters. normally express in gallons per minute, GPM, or cubic feet per second. Cavitation is the formation of bubbles or I should say vapor bubbles in the low pressure region of a pump and their subsequent collapse in the high pressure region. Cavitation damages pumps due to the erosion and pitting that occurs when the vapor bubbles collapse. Cavitation should be avoided, prevented, and corrected to prevent damage to the pump impellers and internal, which could re which will reduce the useful life of the pump. Cavitation can be detected by 
by its distinctive sound. It sounds like it is pumping rocks. Talk about pressure head. A column of fluid creates a pressure at the bottom of the fluid. due to the weight of the fluid pressing down. This pressure can be determined by this equation. Pressure equal to rho g z over g sub c. In standard US units, P pressure in units Pound force per inches squared. Rho density pound mass per cubic feet. G is the gravitational acceleration feet per second squared. Z is height of the column of fluid in feet sometimes z is replaced with h and g sub c is a gravitational constant and the units of pound mass per pound force second squared. So if I ask you to convert one foot of water to pounds force per square inch, how would you do so? Well, we'll use our equation. Pressure is rho g z over g sub c. So we're given one foot of water. Z equals one foot. We know from our reference or looking up the density of water, standard temperature and pressure, 62.4 pound mass feet cubed. We know in US units, the acceleration due to gravity is 32.2 feet per second squared. And G sub C, which is a constant, is 32.2 feet. Ah, feet times pound mass over pound force second squared. 
So, solving for the pressure, rho, 62.4 pound mass over feet cubed, times the acceleration due to gravity. Thirty two point two feet per second squared times Z, which was given as one foot, one foot of water, and you divide this by our gravitational constant G sub C, thirty two point two feet times pound mass over pound force second squared. You left with pressure is equal to 62.4 pound force per feet squared. But we wanted it in pound force per inches squared. So converting pound force per feet squared, we know one foot or one is 12 inches, so one square foot is 144 inches squared giving you one foot of water is equivalent to 0 0.433 pound force per inches squared with 0 0.433 psi So open systems versus closed system. An open system is one where the system takes suction from one source and pumps the fluid to another source a closed system is isolated from the environment. It is a system where the fluid is continuously pumped in a closed loop. <coughs> and we'll stop here for today. If there are any questions, feel free to send me an email and have a safe day.